What is the story behind it? That's a question I often find myself asking whenever I watch an athlete win a major title or championship. There's of course the obvious joy and flooding of emotions, but I'm always curious to know more. I want to know the full story. What they did, what they went through, what they overcame to get there. Now, if you are like me and feel the same, then you have to hear the story of Zhang Ming, a Chinese women's singles player who quite literally went from rock bottom to the top of the world. And the journey there was certainly not straightforward. From losing China a legacy, to being overlooked by her coaches, to contemplating retiring twice, to finally showing the world her true potential, climbing the top of the world, setting records in the process, and becoming a Hall of Famer. Honestly, this is one of my favourite badminton stories. So, if you're interested, then join me now as I take you on Zhang Ning's journey. Her journey on the road to redemption. Like any story, we must first go back to the beginning. And that means we must go back almost 30 years to 1994, where in the infamous Istora Senayan in Jakarta, Indonesia, the Thomas and Yuba Cup Finals were being held. If you are unfamiliar with the Thomas and Yuba Cup Finals, they are basically the men's and women's world team championships. By 1994, this tournament already had an incredibly long and rich history, longer than the world individual championships, and far longer than the world mixed team championships, otherwise known as the Sudaman Cup. And within that rich history, China had its own legacy, a legacy it was very keen to uphold. This is a point that is incredibly important to this story. China first entered the Yuba Cup in 1984, and to say they dominated would be a mild understatement, as by the 94 Yuba Cup, China had not lost a match, winning at every single Yuba Cup they had played in. In Jakarta, unsurprisingly, China once again reached a final where they were to face their home favourites, Indonesia. This was a hotly anticipated match, not just because the home nation was in the final, but because both teams housed an incredible lineup. A lineup filled with current World and Olympic champions like Suzy Cezanti, as well as future World and Olympic champions like Gafei and Gujun. But whilst it was uncertain as to how it would unfold, the general consensus was that it was hard to not see China retain the cup and continue their winning streak. Having said that though, Indonesia got off to a flyer, winning the first two matches. China, being the champions they are, fired back quickly, taking the next two matches, evening it out at 2 all. It's at this point where Zhang Ning comes into the picture. At just 18 years old, Zhang Ning, who was making her debut at these championships, had it all on her shoulders. I mean, she not only had the pressure of living up to her nation's incredibly high expectations, but she also had the pressure of not wanting to be the player responsible for causing China's first ever loss at the Yuba Cup. On top of that, she was to face an insanely talented player by the name of Mir Odina, a name you must remember as she'll play an integral role later. At the time, Mia may have only been 14 years old, but she was already being touted as the next big thing in badminton, a player with insurmountable skills light years ahead of her time and her age. And there's one more small thing I must add, the matter of the crowd. Indonesian supporters are known as the most vocal and passionate in the world, even more so when it comes to their players, and even more so again when it comes to a final at a big tournament. And this was the deciding match of the Yuba Cup in the home of Indonesian badminton, the Astora Sanayan. So you can only imagine things were a little rowdy. To add to this, back in 1994, the crowds at the Astora were so much closer to the action than they are now. Back then, the crowds looked like at any moment they could spill out onto the courts. It comes as no surprise then that this particular crowd wasn't on Zhang's side. But to show clearly how much against Zhang Ning they were, just listen to the difference in the crowd when both players' names are called. With all of this, I cannot begin to imagine how an 18-year-old Zhang Ning, with not much international experience, was feeling, and how she was going to handle this situation. 
As the match got underway, it did seem like all of this was going to be too much for her. The crowd was getting louder and louder with each mere point, and you can see as the camera pans to Zhang in this first game, a real look of worry and panic. Mia quickly won the first game and seemed to be cruising in the second. 8-6 became 9-6, which became 10-6, a team error from Zhang. Championship point for Indonesia. Zhang saved the first one, yet the crowd did not relent. Chants were ringing out across the stadium. It was at this point that a lifeline was given to Zhang Ning. On her second match point, Mia had an open court, but somehow missed putting the shuttle into the net. This clearly rattled Mia, possibly making her acutely aware of the situation she was in, on the cusp of creating history. Whatever happened, Zhang Ning managed to claw her way back into the match. 7-10, 8-10, 9-10, 10-all, then 11-10 to Zhang, game point. As you can hear, not only was the crowd stunned, but so was Jill Clark. But for Zhang, she had somehow escaped and was right back in this match. Could she now go on to win and give China a sixth Uber Cup championship and maintain their undefeated legacy? Well, no. There wouldn't be much of a redemption story if the main protagonist started on a high note now, would there? Miradina came out in the third as if nothing had happened, stormed to a seven love lead, and won the match and the Uber Cup for Indonesia in what might be one of the loudest crowd reactions I have ever heard. Now I'll admit, that was quite a long introduction to this story but I feel it was needed as I really wanted to portray the magnitude and importance of that Uber Cup final and the devastation and effect it had on Zhang Ning. And this isn't just a hyperbole, Zhang Ning admitted as much in an interview. She admitted that not only was that 1994 Uber Cup final loss to Miradina her most regretful and depressing loss of her whole career, but that it almost cost her her entire career. But when you look at the results following that Uber Cup, you can see just how much it affected her. For the rest of 1994 and the whole of 1995, Zhang Ning did not win one tournament. In fact, she didn't get to a single final. It wasn't until 1996 that she managed to get back to winning ways as she won the Swedish International, the Malaysia Open and the China Open. So, is this where Zhang Ning got it back on track and all was well? Not by a long shot. Because you see, in 1996, the Uber Cup Finals were once again being held, this time in Hong Kong, and once again, it was China versus Indonesia in the final. And just as in 1994, it was Indonesia who came out on top, with Zhang Ning losing at third singles once more. Although, this match didn't play as pivotal a role in the outcome, as Indonesia had already won, so this was technically a dead rubber. So, although overall Zhang Ning had a pretty decent 1996, the wound from that 94 Uber Cup was still fresh, and it had kind of been reopened with the 96 Uber Cup result. And the effects of this were going to be felt for a little while longer. Following that 1996 Uber Cup, just as she had done so following the 1994 Uber Cup, Zhang Ning had another finalless year. 1998 did see Zhang Ning find some podiums once more, with two very notable results. The first being the final at the All England Championships, Bampton's oldest and most prestigious event. In those championships, Zhang Ning defeated the aging former World Olympic champion Suzy Cezanti in the third round, as well as two compatriots, including the top seed and world finalist from the year before, Gong Sichao. She wasn't able to replicate this form in the final, however, as she fell to the world champion and BWF Hall of Famer Ye Xiaoying. But still, at the time, this was Zhang's biggest result of her career so far. However, this wasn't enough to get her into the Chinese team for that year's Uber Cup. It must be said though that during this period, China was at its absolute peak in terms of domination. I mean, in the year previous at the World Championships, China had a clean sweep of the medals in women's singles. In fact, they actually had six out of the eight quarter finalists. So being left out of the team and the competition being so high, as well as other youngsters coming up, Zhang Ning had to be thinking her days might be numbered. 
And this feeling could have only been compounded further by the fact that at those 98 Uber Cup finals, China regained their title, winning their sixth Uber Cup. It's out. And I feel not being selected for those Uber Cup finals had a knock-on effect on Zhang, because although she won the Grand Prix finals at the end of the year, the next two years that followed were far less than good. With that nice, strong finish to 1998, it seemed maybe the disappointments of being overlooked for the Uber Cup finals was behind Zhang. But then, well, like the years that followed the previous Uber Cups in 94 and 96, Zhang Ning once again saw a barren patch. She did reach the Asia Championship final, something which can certainly not be snubbed, but aside from that, throughout 1999 and into the new century, Zhang Ning once again failed to reach any finals. And with that in mind, it should come as no surprise that once again Zhang Ning was overlooked by China for the 2000 Uber Cup, Uber Cup where China went on to win again, their seventh Uber Cup title. It was at this point where Zhang Ning first flirted with the idea of retirement. She clearly had the ability to challenge for wins at tournaments. She has shown this on a few occasions. But with the Chinese coaches clearly favouring the other players over her, the fact she was becoming one of the older players, and that she had no major silverware to her name after being on the tour for six years, then it makes sense that these thoughts pass through her mind. But as you can probably work out from the title of this video, Zhang Ning didn't quit. She persevered. And that determination to continue was about to give her her most successful year yet. 2001 started off pretty much like the two previous years. Zhang Ning made two quarterfinals in both Japan and Korea, both of which were respectable results, but with the plethora of other Chinese stars at the time, it once again meant she didn't really stand out. But it was at her third tournament of the year where she had what you could call a mini breakthrough. That third tournament was none other than the World Championships, which that year were being held in Spain. At those World Championships, Zhang Ning came through strongly in the draw, before losing in the semi-finals to the world number two at the time, Zhu Mi. What this result meant was that Zhang Ning managed to win a bronze, her first major medal. It sounds obvious to say that a result like this buoyed Zhang Ning, but it honestly did, because she went on to win her next two tournaments, the Singapore Open and the Asia Championships. Zhang carried this form rather nicely throughout the rest of the year and into 2002, as at the first tournament of 2002, the Korea Open, Zhang Ning won, bagging herself her 10th career title. In fact, 2002 became her best ever year since 1996, as in total she won that Korean Open and also got into five other finals, with one of those being at the Asia Championships. However, 2002 wasn't all good for Zhang, as for the third time in a row she was left out of the Chinese Uber Cup team. And for the third time, without Zhang, China won the title. Now, this period in Zhang's career, I feel, is absolutely pivotal. I say that because it was at this point that she had two very clear choices. The first of those was to retire. Yes, she was starting to have some good success and reaching finals, even a world medal, but by not being selected for the Uber Cup for a third time, kind of shows that the Chinese coaches likely didn't have that much faith in her. On top of this, Zhang Ning was 27 years old. In those days, 27 was already pretty old for a player to still be playing professionally, especially a Chinese player. To highlight this, let me bring up a list of the top Chinese players in and around that time period. Now, let me add to that the age at which they retired. Can you see what I'm talking about now? Not a single one of them played beyond 27. And if you take Zhang's lack of selection for three consecutive Uber Cups with this statistic, and then sprinkle on top of the fact that there was a whole host of new, young, and very talented Chinese women singles players coming up, well then this option must have seemed like the only one. The other option though was of course to stick with it, to take this small run in form, put everything else behind her and carry on. Zhang Ning chose the latter and well soon enough that was about to be proved to be a very good decision. Heading into the biggest tournament of 2003, the World Championships, not too many eyes were on Zhang Ning. While she had reached the semis at the All England, had won the Swiss Open, and was the number two seed at the World Championships, I think the common consensus was that the title would likely go to one of the other Chinese stars, either the All England champion Zhu Mi, or the defending world champion Gong Ru Nha. And this was simply for the reason that they had proven themselves more often in the bigger tournaments than Zhang. But as this tournament progressed, Zhang Ning made herself known to everyone watching, 
that maybe this long overlooked player could very well win the whole thing. This feeling became strongest from the quarterfinals onwards. In the quarterfinals, Zhang Ning faced Danish women's singles queen Camilla Martin. Camilla Martin was a former world champion herself and was the silver medalist from the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Zhang Ning disposed of Camilla in just 22 minutes, 11-6, 11 love, in what was a flawless performance. And she takes it the first time of asking Camilla Martin. Well, it's not often that we've seen her completely outclassed, but she was today. In the semi-finals, Zhang Ning was up against a player I've already mentioned in this video, the player who started this whole story, Mira Odina. Although by 2003 she was now playing for the Netherlands, and although still a fantastic shot maker, lacked the clear physicality to back up her play. But regardless, Zhang Ning didn't even let physical become a factor, because in just 19 minutes, she won 11-7, 11 love. standards as you'd ever want to see. Well, it's just a delight to watch whenever you see an athlete performing to near perfection. In the final, Zhang Ning faced the defending champion and one of her compatriots, Gong Ru Na. Gong Ru Na was not only the defending champion, but was also in fine form, as Lai Zhang had breezed her way into the final. This fact, combined with the six-year age difference, the fact Gong was the reigning champion, and that she held a 4-1 head-to-head against Zhang, with Zhang's only win being under a different scoring system, well, I think to everyone watching, Gong was the clear favourite. And the match started that way, as quite quickly Gong Ru went 4-love up. But it was from being 4-love down that Zhang Ning suddenly found her footing in the match, and from that moment on took control, absolutely dominated the match, and after 43 minutes, Zhang Ning became world champion. This 2003 World Championship win is absolutely incredible for a number of reasons. I hope most of those are rather obvious by this point. You have seen what Zhang has been through throughout this video so far. But it's even more remarkable because at the time of winning this world title, Zhang Ming was 28 years old, an age which made her the oldest ever women's singles world champion. And that's a record that still holds true today, 20 years later. Now you might be watching thinking that this is it. This is where the story ends. Zhang Ning started her international career with a devastating loss, was overlooked by the Chinese coaches for a number of years, had mediocre results at best, but perseveres and becomes the world champion. A title in which, on the way, she beat the very player that gave her her most depressing and regretful loss ever. And whilst yes, that does seem like the story is done, I'm here to tell you that it isn't quite over yet. There's actually a little bit more to tell in this story to truly have it come full circle. Following that World Championship win, Zhang Ning picked up three more titles and moved into 2004 as one of the best players in the world. Now, 2004 had two major events within it, with the biggest of those being the Athens Olympic Games. But before that, there was this small matter of the Thomas and Ewa Cup Finals. This time, with her World Championship gold and consistent results that followed, Zhang Ning made it back into the team. For the first time in eight years, Zhang Ning would be representing China. There was just a small problem though, something which Zhang Ning would have to get over, and that's the fact that the 2004 Yuba Cup was to be held in Jakarta, Indonesia. More specifically, the Astora Sinayan, the exact same hall where Zhang had lost China the trophy 10 years earlier. But whereas in 1994 she looked unsure of herself and was overawed by the situation, here she was, now a world champion and veteran of the circuit. And whilst it can't be understated that the crowd was a little less busy in the 2004 final compared to the 1994 final, Zhang Ning looked cool, calm, and even when the second game did get a little tense in that final, Zhang Ning was this time able to taste success as she helped China secure the title and their ninth Uber Cup. And it was all too clear what this win meant to her. So, with the nightmares of a team competition in the Astora somewhat quelled, there was one more big tournament to go in 2004, and it's there where this whole story comes full circle. At the Athens Olympics, Zhang Ning came in as the second seed, and after a couple of surprisingly close early round matches, 
managed to fight her way into the final. And facing her in the final was, maybe you've guessed it, maybe you haven't. It was Mia Ordina. Ten years on from that Uber Cup final where these two players fought out an epic encounter as teenagers, they now face each other in the final of the biggest one there is, the Olympics. But whereas in 1994, where Mia Ordina came out victorious, throwing her hands aloft in joy, this time it was Zhang Ning who was victorious, throwing her hands in the air. Zhang Ning was the Olympic champion. She had reached the pinnacle of badminton and the emotions were all too clear. The tears in her eyes signified not just that particular moment of victory, but the whole story up until that point. From the lowest of lows, her most depressing loss of her career a decade earlier, to being consistently overlooked by her coaches, becoming world champion, winning the Uber Cup for China in the same hall where she'd lost it before, and finally becoming the Olympic champion, doing so by defeating the very player who had put this whole story in motion. Right, that wraps everything up in a nice little package now, doesn't it? We have the full story, right? Well, kind of. There is a little more, a little more which I'd be remiss to leave out. Because you see, following those 2004 Olympics, Zhang Ning had the best years of her career. She went on to reach two more World Championship Finals in 2005 and 2006, as well as a bronze in 2007. She helped China regain the Uber Cup again in 2006, and she also led China to Sudaman Cup glory twice, scoring the winning point of the 2007 edition. But maybe the biggest of them all was in 2008 at her home Olympics in Beijing, as at the age of 33, whilst facing multiple injuries and an opponent who had defeated her in those two World Championship finals, Zhang Ning retained her Olympic title, becoming the first singles player in history to do so. There is no doubting that Zhang Ning achieved absolutely amazing feats. When she was inducted into the BWF Hall of Fame in 2021, no one could argue it. But to me, what stands out way above her results and records is how she did it, what she went through to achieve them. The perseverance, resilience and determination to simply not give up and keep going is quite honestly inspirational. Zhang Ning's story, her road to redemption as I put it at the start, is one of my favourite stories in Bampton that I have unearthed so far. It's a story that I hope inspires you, the viewer, and I hope it's a story that I've managed to do justice. Wow, that ended up being quite a long story. So if you've made it this far, then from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I wasn't lying when I said how much I love this story. I created a shorter version for the BDRF about two years ago when Zhang Ning got inducted into the BDRF Hall of Fame and I've wanted to make a longer version ever since. If you have anything you want to add then please do feel free to get in the comments and let me know. And if you have any of your own favourite badminton stories or just suggestions that I could use to make future videos then also please do let me know. If you enjoyed this video today and you want to see more like it then you're in luck because there's two more that you can click on right here. And lastly, if you haven't subscribed already and you fancy it, then please do. And don't forget to ring that bell so that you're notified when my next video comes out. Thanks again, everyone. I'm Ben Beckman. I'll see you next time.